We are live. It's Dr. J in the house with Rob Edwards. Today, we're going to be talking about N-acetylcysteine, or NAC for short, H. pylori, and biofilms associated with it. All right, This is a big thing that we see in practice all the time. H. pylori is a very common bacterial infection, and sometimes it can be very resistant. We're going to talk about the biofilm aspect and some of our favorite tools that we use uh, out in the field to get patients clinical results. Rob, how are we doing, man? What's cooking, brother? Hey, doing great. Thanks again. It's a uh... Good to be on here as always. Um, ready to dive into this uh, subject, H. pylori, and uh, you know, talk about this uh, very uh, difficult thing that I think about a third of the population of the world, maybe even more, has. Um, so this is a culprit that many, many people are dealing with, in particular if they've got some sort of a symptom, uh, you know, associated with it. And so, uh, so yeah. So, let's the, get it going. so regarding the common symptoms, I know your daughter was dealing with a H. pylori issue out of the gate. First off, why don't you just hit some of the more common symptoms, and then just walk through your daughter's experience? And she was going more on the con more on the conventional side because she's an adult, so she's kind of going her own thing. But talk about what her experience was getting ruled out on the conventional side uh, with the H. pylori situation. Yeah. So you know, I've got limited information. We just talked. She went into a gastroenterologist last week. And uh, still, it's sort of the same old, same old, pointing at, uh, you know, the, uh, protein pump inhibitors, uh, trying to break down the acid. Surgery was not surgery was another option, but really not getting into, you know, looking at the health of the overall gut. That's not their first inclination. And uh, it's sort of frustrating, of course. And my daughter's old enough now that she's, you know, she's, you know, when we're 18, 19, we kind of think we know everything. And yes. so I'm, I'm, yep. I'm sharing yeah. stuff with her uh, <laughs> with the degree of, you know, understanding the context uh, that we're in, but yeah, sort of, sort of the common things. I mean, she's had, um, in, uh, gassed, like acid reflux for a good majority of her life. Um, and now she's finally ready to get serious about it. We've tried different kinds of diets. She's been on a diet now for two months. It's more of a paleo restrictive diet. It's not a FODMAP, but she's getting ready to go into that. But some of the things that, uh, that we see with H pylori is, you know, burning abdominal or stomach pain. We've got nausea and vomiting, uh, loss of appetite, frequent yeah, nausea. burping, um, Heart, heartburn, of course, a reflex like we just talked about, gas and bloating, unintentional weight loss, and then uh, you could have black or bloody stools. And she kind of comes in more of the heartburn. She gets bloated, um, generally doesn't feel well, and she's about as light as a feather. So, <laughs> so those are kind of what she's got going on. And what about the mood, mental health issues? I mean, I see a lot with H. pylori. There's, I mean, I'll pull it up right now. We'll we'll put it up on air. But H. pylori and mood and mental health stuff. I mean, there's like a strong connection with H. pylori and brain fog and despre and depression. I mean, I'll pull this one study up here I've, I've seen over the years because I see so many patients clinically. And yes, like you know, the typical bloating, constipation, diarrhea, that kind of dyspepsia, um, acid reflux, regurgitation, or you know, gastroparesis. You lay down, the food sitting there for a while, so you get that acid coming up and that silent reflux at night. That's um, that's a common thing that we see. But there's also the mental health mood component. And most people, when they have, they don't feel good, brain foggy, depressed, or anxious, it's it's interesting because they go to the medical doctor, right? Your conventional MD. Odds are when they're recommending looking at the gut, typically, right? They're going to reach for an SSRI. And so it's really important that when people have chronic gut issues um, as a root cause, but they have a lot of these mental health, brain fog mood issues, you got to look at the gut. Uh, super important. Yeah. And so you can see right here out of patients with H. pylori, right? Positive, right? This is 12% had depression, right? So this is just one study here looking at the, the depression component with H. pylori. Um, it's important, right? Mood, mental health things. One of the more common symptoms I see with my patients right here, yeah. depression among people with dyspepsia. That just means like indigestion and then H. pylori. And so this is the big, this is Ethiopia. I guarantee you it's much higher here, right? I've seen different studies, um, you know, showing that because we know, you know, we're probably one of the more depressed countries in the world, probably just because of more processed food and, and junky fats and gluten exposure. Uh, you talked about some of the gluten stuff with your daughter too, or I think you said gluten and low FODMAP. The problem with the low FODMAP, which it can be helpful, but a lot of conventional gastroenterologists, they recommend low FODMAP diets that also still have a lot of inflammation in it. And, and that's a problem. And so that's why when we deal with patients that have a lot of bloating or gas, usually with H. pylori, we can have SIBO at the same time. So this is the issue. A lot of people get very focused on one microbe. They're like, oh, it's H. pylori, but you could have H. pylori along with SIBO. And SIBO is this 
essentially in bacterial overgrowth, typically from the colon up to the small intestine. And then usually there's an aberration in different hydrogen and methane gases that can throw off motility, either diarrhea, constipation. And usually you'll see different bacteria like Klebsiella, Citrobacter, Pseudomonas, Morganella. These are the bacteria driving it. So we'll look at different stool tests and we'll pick, figure out what bacteria it is. And if we need, we can also run a breath test to see if those gases are elevated. But H. pylori can be part of that. And so you can go into your gastro. They can say it's H. pylori, you know, you know ulcerations, those kind of things, acid reflux. It's probably at play, but there could be other things too. And that's why if you go after it alone or you go after it with an antibiotic, you can create other problems like fungal overgrowth. You can create um, you can create, you can have biofilm issues, which we'll talk about biofilms in H. pylori. So then we may not get it with the typical clarithromycin, amoxicillin, triple or quad therapy. So sometimes we can kind of get between a rock and a hard place conventional wise. Yeah. And so even going back to, you're talking about mental health, right? Is that, you know, your psychiatrist isn't going to be thinking about taking a GI map, you know, stool test. They're not thinking in, in those terms. So people can suffer with this no. stuff for a long time, really unneedingly. Um, you know, there is a huge correlation with this. Dr. Perlmutter actually talked a lot about this in his book. Uh, I think it's called The Brain, Grain Brain, mm -hmm. um, where he made some good connections. And, you know, you know, things that are happening inside of the GI system, you know, you could have symptoms there. But to your point, you can also have systems that are more systematic, the brain fog, the mental illness, uh, joint pain, right? There's other avenues uh, that can point towards an upstream issue at the gut. And I think that's super important for people to understand is that, you know, as we get older and we start dealing with more chronic issues, it, it's very difficult for us to think about, hey, maybe there's something going on with the gut. And traditional medicine almost never does that, right? No matter what's mm -hmm. going on, they're, they're traditionally not going to be looking upstream to the gut. And, and we can find a ton of research and data out there that suggests that the gut has a lot to do with, with many, many, many different uh, chronic issues. Yep. And then right here, this one other study here, the study here looks at H. pylori, gastritis, and depression, mm -hmm. right? And they're using uh, antidepressants here, but that's partly because there's such a, a strong association with gastritis and H. pylori and mood issues. And so this is, you know, a really important thing that we, uh, we want to be thinking about here out of the gates, because we don't want to just think about acid reflux, bloating, constipation, diarrhea. Mm -hmm. We also want to think about the other issues that, I mean, almost any patient I see that has chronic digestive issues, chronic gut issues, there's almost always a mood and energy and a cognitive association too. So really important to keep that in mind. Uh, just kind of piggyback into what you said, right? So your daughter goes in, did they run a scope and took a, like a sample of the gastric mucosa to pick up H. pylori? Or did they run a breath test? Or did they do a blood antibody test or a stool or all of the above? Which ones are they you? Well, so that's a good question, right? So she's, they haven't done any of that yet. So I'm not sure what direction they're going to go. So she's seeing both a gastroenterologist and she's also seeing, you know, a functional medicine doctor, um, both which is kind of a problem within itself, right? Because yes. like they're coming from two different perspectives. And it's like, you know, you go through and you have an elimination diet. And then all of a sudden, you know, the, the gastroenterologist is saying, hey, why don't you take some uh, you know, antibiotics? And it's like, well, we need to see what one test is going to going to show out versus another test. And, and that's where there's a lot of problems in between sometimes integrative and or miscommunication between practitioners is this really needs to be an orderly thing. Um, gut issues sometimes don't get resolved because it's just not being done in the right order. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of like kind of the order and dealing with some, yeah. gut, some gut issues related to H. pylori? Yeah. So just when you talked about a couple of things here, I want to highlight the big four tests that your, your gastro is going to do to look at H. pylori. They're going to look at potentially a stool test, a stool antigen. So mm -hmm. they'll put it up against a stain and they'll see if they can see it. Um, it'll typically do a breath test, which is they give the patient some urea and urea is a kind of a protein metabolite and the H. pylori makes an enzyme called urease and that urease hits the urea and then spits out ammonia and CO2. And this is part of the reason why H. pylori makes stomach digestion difficult because ammonia has got a pH of 11. If you look at that pH scale, right? Zero or one's pure acid, 14's pure alkaline. Well, you're about 11 with the ammonia. And so that's going to make it harder to digest. That creates more of the bloating and the gas and dyspepsia. And of course, you need good acidity to, to close that esophageal sphincter. So then it's easier to have reflux too, right? Um, but H. pylori, it's, it's a helix shape, right? H stands for helico. So it helixes in and kind of corkscrews into the gut lining, creating gastritis. Yep. Um, but on that note, it's going to create that CO2, right? So that urea, urease, right? Urease then causes the ammonia. That's the high pH and then the CO2. So they're going to measure that high CO2 as a positive breath test. That can be helpful to pick that up. Um, they may run a blood antibody test. Usually an IgA or an IgM could be helpful if it's more acute. IgG could be a longer term thing. Now, 
in the functional medicine world, we like some of the genetic stool tests because it'll give us a, a, a quantitative number based on a PCR scale. And typically 1,000 cells is going to be our positive threshold. And so the nice thing about it is you can have some patients come back negative, right, with H. pylori, but they're at 400 cells or 500 cells. Right. And then you got to say, well, are those cells enough with the fungal stuff downstream or some of the other Citrobacter or Klebsiella that's elevated? Is that enough where that could be driving symptoms? And a lot of times it could be. And so we may see patients that are negative on a test that it still may be a part of a, the problem that's it still may be a big enough player in the problem creating symptoms. We may have to lower the levels a little bit. So it's nice to have a, a broader picture and to get more of a, a quantitative type of analysis using DNA, which is a many, many thousand times sent more sensitive than what you may see in a stool antigen test, et cetera. Yeah. And so that brings it into the, the conversation, the biofilms that you mentioned, is that like, Oh yeah, we'll get in the biofilms too. Yeah. So the H. pylori being that, being the shape, but it also has the, it screws in to your epithelial lining, it screws into your gut, which makes it very difficult to get rid of it. I mean, there's some people that deal with this stuff for, for quite a long time trying to get rid of the H. pylori. And in addition to that, you can pass it along to your partner. Generally speaking, if you have it, or if it comes up in my testing, like you did with me, I had H. pylori. I assumed that yep, Emily had it. I remember it. that. I assumed that Emily had it. I assumed that probably even our kids have it. And so yep. um, that that's one of those key pieces to understand as well. It's like, so if you're just dealing with yourself, and you're working on H. pylori within yourself, but you're not with your partner or you're not with your kids as well, then you might have an issue because you're just going to re-expose yourself again and again and again and again. So that's something to consider as well. Absolutely. Now with antibiotics too, I'm going to just share this tab here. Biofilms are a big deal. And biofilms are kind of this slimy type of film that lines over the actual bacteria itself. And so, you know, typically a slimy film, it's kind of, usually it's made of like chitin and different things like this. I mean, you can, I'll give you a couple of definitions, but it's going to be that slimy kind of polysaccharide type of material that goes over the bacteria. I'll pull up a couple of pictures that you guys can see and visualize that here. Oh, and so here's one right here. You can see, you see this little kind of, this little film on top right here, right in this area here. You can see it kind of circled there or there. I think this you little, have the, I'm looking at the wrong picture. There you go. Now, now it's up. Yeah. And so you can see there's a little bit of a slimy layer there and you can see it here as well. So if you look at here, these different phospholipids here, these little biofilms right on the outside. So you can see some of the biofilms are going to be in blue, um, for instance. Um, and so these little, little guys right there. So you can see we're trying to break that biofilm layer up. And so with H. pylori, for instance, if we look at some of the data on it, I'm going to pull up one big study I just saw that I wanted to pull it up for you. Okay. Let me grab it. Here it is. Yeah, so biofilm formation is one of the big, the bigger reasons why H. pylori has antibiotic resistance to it. All right, this is a big thing. We run genetic stool tests, and on that, page five on that stool test, it'll look at the major families of antibiotics, and it will look at, is there genetic resistance? And we see quite frequently, I'd say maybe a quarter to a third of patients, I see some degree of genetic resistance. And so when you have that, in conjunction with added biofilm resistance, that can make the antibiotic resistance even worse, right? And so you can see here, biofilm formation is critical, not only for environmental survival, but also successful infection. So the biofilms make the infection successful to even, even occur. H. pylori is one of the most common causes of bacterial infections in humans. Mm -hmm. And it's demonstrated that the microorganism has biofilm forming ability in the environment and on the human gastric mucosa. So super, super important. You look at the conclusion here, H. pylori infections, therefore investigate H. pylori biofilm formation could be effective in elucidating the detailed mechanism of the infection and how it colonizes. And so when we work with patients on the functional medicine side, we're always looking at one, is there a genetic resistance to certain antibiotics? I tend to be more on the more biased to the natural botanical herbal antimicrobials. One, they have a more broad spectrum of hitting other beneficial um, or other microbes that are maybe SIBO creating or yeast creating. A lot of times antibiotics may be more specific. They may not target gram positive. They may not target yeast. They may not hit back uh, parasites as well. So I like some of the herbs for that reason. Number two, herbs do a lot better with efflux pumps. Efflux pumps are the ability for antibiotics to essentially pump, get pumped out of the cell wall. So imagine like you have a canoe, for instance. You're in the canoe. Let's, let's call you the bacteria, all right? Imagine we have a hole in the canoe. And let, let's, let's say the antibiotics are the water outside of the canoe. So if we have a hole in the canoe, the water comes into the cell, into the canoe, 
right? But if you have a bucket and you're bailing the water outside of the canoe, that's like an efflux pump. So the goal is the antibiotics come in, they overflow the canoe, the canoe sinks, you kill the H. pylori, kill the bacteria. But if you're constantly bailing the water out of the canoe, that's what an efflux pump is doing to antibiotics into the cell wall. And so efflux pumps play a big role with allowing herbals to work well. Also, when you look at other antibiotics, you'll see a lot of oxidative stress and mitochondrial damage with certain antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And part of that is, is they can be very stressful and strong on the body. When we use botanicals or certain herbals, there's going to be a lot of high quality antioxidants and bioflavonoids a lot of times in some of these herbals, whether it's oil of oregano and carvacol, whether it's different berberines, whether it's golden seal or barberry or organ grape, whether it's timona or dill. These herbs are going to have a botanical nutrient antioxidant quality to it. And so that's going to allow the killing that takes place to not create as much oxidative and or mitochondrial damage. And two, it's going to allow the efflux pumps to work better. And it's going to allow, meaning it's going to allow us to inhibit the efflux pumps. Think of that canoe, right? If we inhibit the efflux pumps, we're pulling the, the, the bucket out of the canoe um, possession, and that's to allow the canoe to take on water, take on more of the antimicrobial and sink it. So we have efflux pumps, we have um, antioxidant and mitochondrial stress, and then of course, we're also going to be throwing in herbals that are going to have biofilm disruption capacity. And so in this video, we talked about NAC. NAC is one of these amazing antioxidant kind of amino acid peptides that we love because one, it makes glutathione. Glutathione is a master antioxidant. It's, gonna, it's a mucolytic, so if you have breathing or stress issues with mucus, it's going to help with that. And um, it's also a powerful antioxidant, and it's going to disrupt and basically take that mucusy layer, and it's going to dehydrate it and break it up due to its mucolytic qualities. Yeah, and I think just to touch on like antibiotics as well, some people, you know, they, they get started on the antibiotics, and it's like you know, if you don't finish a round of that, uh, you know, you're, you're going to end up strengthening uh, the issues that are going on inside of your body. And then in addition to that, the reason I like herbs as well is because it's a little bit more of a gentle approach. Yep. Um, herbs have a, have a way of, of doing things that are more, sometimes it's a longer route, but it's a more effective route than, can be. Yep. you know, it's sort of like burning the, the forest, right? If you burn the forest, everything flourishes twice, like twofold, 10 years later. Right. And that's sort of like the equivalent of an antibiotic versus, Hey, we're going to, we're going to fail a couple of wood, uh, a couple of trees and kind of sparse it out over time. Right. It, it's longer, but I think it's more effective. Absolutely. Now, we look at one study here. They're looking at NAC in biofilms. In this study, they're looking at in wounds of mice. They're looking at the Pseudomonas aeruginosa bacteria, which we see in the gut a lot too. Yeah. And when used before biofilm is formed, NAC leads to bacterial cell death, where treatment after the biofilm was established, uh, it was harder to knock down the bacteria. Mechanistically, we show that NAC can penetrate the bacterial membrane it increased oxidative stress and halt protein synthesis. So it allowed essentially that slimy mucus layer to be broken down because NAC is a mucolytic, right? We also use yeah. NAC when we have sinus issues, drainage issues, because it does help knock down the mucus. It does. They use, um, I think it's a mucomist where they use it for asthmatics and people that have serious mucus in their lungs or in their sinuses. You can nebulize NAC and use it to bring down mucus in your lungs, which is important because that may impact um, oxygen transfer capacity. And so if you have breathing issues or you have lung inflammation, it can help with that too. I mean, NAC, just to kind of go back historically, is a tripeptide, or I should say it's the key nutrient in the tripeptide complex of glutathione. Mm. Glutathione is the major tripeptide composed of cysteine or N-acetylcysteine, glutamine, glycine, and NAC or cysteine tends to be the rate limiting cofactor in that process. So we have glutamine, very common in our meats and animal products. We have glycine, which is going to be more common in collagen and bone broth, but the, the one we tend to miss to make glutathione is going to be cysteine. And so by getting the cysteine, you're helping with the oxidative stress. You're helping with the mucus and, and the mucolytic aspects. You're breaking down the biofilms. You're helping with antioxidant status in the body as well, because when we process and kill a lot of these microbes, we have to deal with the lipopolysaccharides and the endotoxins, which are the outer cell wall of these bacteria. And these can be very toxic and we have to process it. And that may require extra glutathione to be able to handle it, run those phase two glutathione and acetylation pathways to eradicate and push those toxins out. Yeah, and I think just from a clinical perspective, like at least inside of what what, what we do in our clinic, you know, we're seeing H. pylori in about 80 to 90% of the people that are coming with 
you know, mood issues or mental issues yep. or coming in with gut issues or joint pain. So, I mean, it's prevalent. It's, it's highly prevalent. I mean, what are you seeing inside of, uh, of your practice? Well, when someone comes in with a chronic H. pylori issue, I mean, they can have constipation or even diarrhea, but a lot of times you'll see constipation. Um, many times from that, because of the acidity being impacted for quite a while, they may have lower stomach acid. So now they're not able to break down amino acids properly. I think that's part of the reason why depression and mood issues happen because you're not breaking down your protein. At Newsflash, protein is going to be the building block of all of your neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine. So at, that ha that's how it impacts, in my opinion, mood mechanistically, what's happening. And then, of course, as you activate those toll-like receptors in the intestinal tract, that's the, the centurion guard. That's going to promote gut permeability, and that activates the immune system. So now your chance of like autoimmune issues actually goes up. You can go on PubMed. We can, we can do it right now and bring the receipts here. But you'll see here, for instance, H. pylori and Hashimoto's. I mean, there's a strong connection with that. Hashimoto's being, or yeah, the association, H. pylori was confirmed to be significant in both Hashimoto's and Graves. And so it's a strong prom provoker and promoter of autoimmunity, possibly through gut permeability, uh, activating those toll-like receptors, increasing that zonulin protein. When zonulin's up, the gut lining zipper goes down, right? Toll-like receptor is stimulated, nuclear factor kappa beta, increased zonulin, that gut lining, that interior, that enterocyte kind of junction here starts to get unzipped and different particulate, lipopolysaccharides, undigested food particulate can get through and get that immune system overly activated. What do you think about that, Rob? Yeah, you know, and then just, you know, from a upstream effect, of course, you know, we always talk about stress, right? Stress is a big inhibitor that can create a, uh, an opportunity for H. pylori to take place in the first place. Um, Yes. Yeah. So touching on that, you know, uh, we put ourselves in, into a sympathetic mode or a fight or flight state. Um, one of the things that it suppresses that are, is our gut function. When our gut function is suppressed as well as our immune system and we, our sex hormones are, are suppressed as well. And so there's opportunity for uh, bacteria, yeast, uh, overgrowth, um, parasites, you know, everything environmentally to come in and create havoc inside of our body, especially once it gets in through the, uh, to the bloodstream you know, via the small intestine. And so I think that's a super important um, piece of the puzzle as well when we're talking about H. pylori and the root causes of, you know, how does this stuff take place or get get an opportunity inside of our gut in the first place? Yeah, I'll pull up another receipt here in a second. But this article is looking at um, low gastric acid induces bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine and contributes to malnutrition. And this is looking at developing countries, but um, this is what I'm seeing here because people don't realize it, but acidity, acidity is actually going to have a mild antibacterial effect, right? Think about it. We, we see some of like, um, people making their homemade disinfectants for like their countertops. A lot of times there's some kind of a vinegar base to it, right? What's a vinegar, right? White vinegar or apple cider vinegar is acetic acid. So it's got a nice low pH of three. And so look at this hydrochloric acid in the stomach is frequently encountered in subjects. So the, the whole idea is that, um, acid acid is going to have an antimicrobial effect. And so they're looking at hypochlorhydria. That means low stomach acid. It compromises the gut, ba the gut bacteria, the gut barrier, right? This is going to be our, um, this is going to be our gastric mucosa, right? And then it's going to favor bacterial overgrowth and it's going to impact nutrient absorption as well. And so this is part of it. Now, Rob, you also talked about stress. Well, let's think about what stress does, right? When you're stressed, whether it's physical, chemical, or emotional, Functional medicine primarily deals with the chemical stuff, right? Food stuff, nutrient deficiency stuff. But if someone's stressed emotionally, that's going to activate the sympathetic nervous system. That's part of the fight or flight. We have the parasympathetic, which is the rest or digest. That's the brake pedal. The gas is going to be the fight or flight. So when the fight or flight's activated, our adrenals are surging out adrenaline or, um, and, or norepinephrine or catecholamines. That's going to surge cortisol. That's going to cause that nervous system to then start to deviate blood to the arms and legs and feet so it can fight and flee. It's going to also increase sugar, glucose in the bloodstream. So we have muscle, we have a instant fuel source for our muscles to go and fight. And so this is a problem because now we're increasing glucose. We're not using it because we're stressed at our computer or stressed driving the car. And then now we are starting to create this impact of lower acid, lower enzymes. So for eating food, our ability to digest goes down. And then now because the acid's so low, 
according to that study, now we make ourselves more prone to bacteria coming in from the outside world. Yeah. I mean, it just puts, it's a whole, it's a whole cycle, right? Uh, it's like chicken at the egg type of thing, but the toxicity exactly. is coming in. When you say physical, chemical, or emotional, from an emotional perspective, I mean, it's really just understanding the environment that we're in is a completely different environment than we were in 10, 15, even maybe five years ago, um, where we've just got so many stressors uh, between news, between, you know, this information that we're getting, I like to call it like toxic information, right? That we've got to separate ourselves from that kind of stuff because it does have an effect on our body. And we don't, again, we don't correlate that back to our gut. We don't correlate that back to our immune system. We don't correlate it back to all of these different things, but you know, it's difficult to get a healthy person sick if they're healthy. So how do you get unhealthy, right? What are the things that we do to get in unhealthy, right? It's sort of like, well, toxicity, like chemical, physically, or emotionally. And then we have deficiencies. What are we deficient inside of our body? Like what vitamins, yep. minerals are we missing? Creating an opportunity for disease to take place or H. pylori or anything to really take place and start to get us sick. 100%. So we're talking about acid. We're talking about stress. That We can also go into, so we have, we have chronic stress. That's going to lower the stomach acid. That's going to allow things like H. pylori or SIBO or fungal overgrowth to happen. Many people, the first time that's happened, they've probably gotten an antibiotic and that's probably thrown off their microbiome a little bit, may have created a fungal overgrowth. It may have knocked down a lot of the beneficial bacteria in the bifidobacter and lactobacillus family. That may have thrown off motility. And so a lot of these things, they don't just happen in a vacuum. They kind of compound over time due to not handling the issue the first time, maybe having poor diet choices, maybe being stressed, maybe having low acid, low enzymes. We can also talk about bile salts. Bile salts are also uh, mild antimicrobial as well. And so if we have biliary insufficiency as well, that makes it harder to break down our foods. Now we have more fermentation happening, more rancidification happening, more putrefaction, meaning the food is kind of rotting. It's like uh, leaving food in your garbage for too long. It starts to smell. The flies start to come out. That's kind of what's happening in a lot of people's guts. Yeah. Well, and it attracts things, right? Yeah. It's getting bad, exactly. but it attracts things. I mean, you know, put out your garbage in the summer. By the end of the summer, if you're not taking it out on time, you're going to have all kinds of uh, insects and different things like that inside of there. Critters and stuff. Yeah. The same kind of thing is, I mean, this is a, it's a microcosm, right? Like what, what we yeah. see happen on the outside, oftentimes what we're seeing happening on the inside. Yeah. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't be difficult. So I think that this lends to the idea that like, there's a logical strand of understanding here, that like, if you can understand some of the visual things that you see just in and around you of how the cycle of food and the cycle of, of everything works, then it, it's not hard to understand that, that same kind of a thing can be happening inside of your gut. And I think at the yep. end of the day, that's kind of what we're getting at. And, and that's the, that's sort of the beginning of, of setting the template for disease dysfunction you know, all of these other things that people are experiencing. And, you know, the good news is we can reverse that and we can also yeah. see what's going on. We have great labs and tests and things like that, that we can utilize that the general um, traditional medicine isn't using. And they're not, they're not using these tests right off the bat. Um, and with functional medicine, what's so great is we're, we're, we're diving in deep to try to understand what's going on inside of your body. How stinky is it? Right. Yeah. Like what, where's the issues that we can start to address from a healing opportunity perspective and H pylori is just one of many. Um, there's, you know, candida can be going on. There's all kinds of things in the gut. Yeah. It's candida or CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth. No, I agree. Mm -hmm. And also too, what, you know, we, in the trash can analogy, I mean, the missing thing in the trash can analogy, it's not perfect, but it's good is there's no immune system in your trash can. Right. And so the more our immune system is provoked, you know, if you look at just kind of cutting edge literature on all different diseases that, you know, are invented or found or established, most of these newer diseases over the last decade or so, they tend to have an autoimmune mechanism. Yeah. It's like sent to be some kind of an immune attack, whether it's attaching neurological tissue, whether it's attacking connective tissue, joints or tendons or hearts or, you know, soft tissue in the vascular, there tends to be an autoimmune component. And we know infections and we know the immune system and gut permeability and these toll-like receptor activation and the inflammation that comes from it, from nuclear factor, kappa beta, yeah. C-reactive protein, they're going to be part of this whole catalyst. And so the more you can jump on it, you can avoid a lot of this collateral damage that happens downstream. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a shot in the dark, but I'd say that we're the immune system, right? Human beings. When you see your trash overflowing, right? Yeah. You need to do something yes. About yeah. You yeah. That's a, that's a good, right? yeah. 
you yeah. take it out. But here's the interesting thing too, is like, I remember we were in Conway, Massachusetts, right? And like I had, so there's a piece of trash that fell behind like all the other trash, right? And it was sitting up against our, um, it was sitting up against our like plywood. And it, I didn't see it, you know, it was like a year, however long it was. And it, you know, with all of the, the, the maggots and all the different insects and everything else. And, and just the, uh, uh, the moisture started to create mold and started to create a, a hole and a softness inside of the board where again, it was damaging something that was good. That's supposed to be a part of the house, but because I didn't take it out enough time, it started affecting things in different kind of a way. And I guess from a large perspective, that's kind of what we're talking about. Your gut's a great area to start, but we're not yeah. taking out the trash. We're not doing the things we're not draining properly. We're not detoxifying properly. Um, it's going to start affecting other things. And from autoimmune, I think that makes perfect sense to me that it eventually starts spreading. And now the immune system is not sure exactly what they're supposed to do, right? Yeah, I got another trash story for you too. A couple Thanksgivings ago, we got a turkey. And then there was, you know, there's a little bit left at the, you know, at the, at the base. And I'm like, ah, you know, I'm going to just put it out in my backyard for like a night and let some animal have a feast, right? Yeah. And then the next day I come back, uh, taking my kids to school, and I see the carcass in the middle of the street. And I'm like, oh, my God, I felt so embarrassed. Like, here we are in my neighborhood, this big tur turkey carcass. I'm like, yeah, that's me. I'll pick it up. Don't worry. Yeah. Thinking I'm doing a nice thing, right? But this is what's happening with your immune system, right? This is happening in your gut and your body, right? And so we got to dive in. And again, you know, just I always like to kind of draw a line, like conventional medicine, right? The approach is acid blockers because H. pylori can create inflammation in the gut lining can make your gut lining more sensitive um, because it's inflamed. So the acid can now be a potential irritant. The problem is you need acid for good function. So we're sacrificing function to have some palliative relief with an omniprazole or a Tums or some kind of a PPI blocker. Not good because we don't want to ever basically sacrifice function for symptom relief. Maybe in the short term, it's fine. A couple days, maybe a week, but not long term. Low stomach acid opens us up for more microbes opens us up for indigestion, lack of digesting protein, which becomes our brain nutrients, lack of ionizing minerals, right? Women, calcium are good minerals for our good, healthy bones, osteoporosis. Guys, we need to absorb our protein for muscles or for our brain nutrients, right? Very important. For whatever tissue in your body you're worried about, we need to be able to ionize it and break it down. And so um, we talked about omniprazole. And maybe we're going to be diagnosed with IBS as well because maybe there's some constipation or some diarrhea along with it. And then maybe they'll throw a triple therapy on there, which is like a clarithromycin or an amoxicillin. Maybe they'll throw a Prilosec on there, maybe a bismuth, whether it's triple or quad therapy. Maybe they sub in doxycycline for the omniprazole or clarithromycin. These are the kind of the general 10 to 14 day protocols that are usually prescribed. And again, we're going to be a little different because we're going to use some of these herbals. We're going to test for a wider variety of microbes. We're going to use different biofilm support, like we talked about the NAC, very helpful. We may also use things like ginger, right? Ginger, ginger tea. And my patients, a lot of times, will do a ginger tea. They'll sip it because it's very anti-inflammatory. It helps with that gastric mucosa, that atrophic gastritis. We'll add some manuka in there too because it has a mild antibacterial. We may add in some zinc carnosine to help with the gut lining. I may add in silver. Silver is very helpful and very anti-biofilm as well, kind of knock some of those biofilms down. And you can see we're going to look at other microbes that are happening. We're going to look at the nervous system because a lot of times the nervous system is in this fight or flight state. So we may have to look at the hormones, look at the adrenals. And again, your conventional medicine is going to, person is going to probably look at it and say, okay, here's your triple therapy, your quad therapy. Here, uh, here's an omniprazole, right? And, and we'll do symptom management for the constipation or diarrhea and we're going to call it a day. That's typically it. And um, just to highlight one thing, a lot of times they won't look at the antibiotic resistance element. They won't look at a lot of the probiotic or the fungal overgrowth uh, elements that can happen as a result of a lot of these therapies. We'll call that kind of collateral damage. Yeah, absolutely, man. I think, you know, when we look at, uh, <clears throat> when I'm dealing with clients, what I tell them is, hey, you know, some of the stuff that you're doing is fine, like you said, in the short term. Uh, when you're when you're dealing with PPIs or things like that, they're fine in the short term, but it's like a credit card. And I tell them you got to pay me back with diet and lifestyle, right? Because yep. you've got to fix the underlying issue. Because you take, you know, say you take Tums for example, it, that's going to create an issue three or four years from now, and then you're going to get another medication for that, and that's going to create another issue, and then you're going to get another med medication for that. And if you go back to the root cause, that's what we're talking about: is we got to deal with the first things first, because we don't want to just be using credit cards all the time. Right. Using credit cards all the time, you're going to be broke. Your body's going to be worse off than in the very beginning. And so, 100%. Yeah, great talk, man. We, we want to.
no, this is great. This is great. And again, we want to do testing that's a little bit more sensitive so we can pick up lower levels of these things or subclinical levels. Because a lot of times you could still have some symptoms and maybe you fly under the radar of an endoscopy, of a breath test, or of um, a stool antigen test that's going to be less sensitive. And so it's good to be aware of that. Again, we'll put links down below, guys. And we'll put some recommended things that we do. I mean, we do some stool testing. Again, it's always good to do it in conjunction with a practitioner working with it because you never want to address something in isolation. You get better results addressing the, the whole picture. So we'll put links down below for different stool options. Again, Rob sees patients over at heritagehealth.life, heritagehealth.life. Reach out there. Dr. J, myself, justinhealth.com. You'll see links for work with Dr. J and work with Rob. Feel free. Um, and guys, just I, you know, just want, I always want people to understand because many people, they're going to have gone to the conventional medicine side. I want you to understand what conventional medical people's thinking is. They're worried about H. pylori progressing to gastric cancer. Right. There's a slight risk if you don't do that. There's you can have gastric cancer. You can have okay. ulceration. So they're worried about that for sure. You know, I'm more worried about the people that never get that far, that have chronic gut issues, chronic mood issues, uh, and that lasts their whole life. Conventional medicine is really good at picking up the severe cases, right? These are the people with blood in their stool. They're coughing up blood, right? But what about the people in between where they're not quite sick enough? to get that diagnosis and, and get a plan that really gets them better. They may get a diagnosis, but it's okay. It's an acid blocker for the rest of your life. Maybe it's some Gaviscon. That's, we know that's not fixing the root problem. So we want to look at the extreme and say, yeah, it's good to get that looked at. We want to knock our cancer risk down. That's smart. But we also want to acknowledge that most people will be somewhere in the middle and that we want to provide an option functional medicine wise so they can get to the root cause. Yeah. We don't ever want you to get that diagnosis. I mean, at the end yeah. of the day, you kind of know when you're starting to trend that way, you're going to know brain fog, gut issues. Like you start having these kind of things happening from a chronic perspective. Uh, it's time to get help. It, it just is. If you're in that level, it's time to get health, whatever your age is. And in particular, if you're 40 and over, over and you've got brain fog, you've got mood issues, you've got, you know, you've got gut issues, you've got joint pain and all of this stuff is consistent, consistent, chronic you probably need to start working on things. Yeah. And a lot of times diagnoses can be overrated because unless the diagnosis is somehow addresses the root cause, then a lot of times you're just symptom managing and, um, and trying to get some relief. But in the end, you're just like, you're saying you're buying time and you're going to have to pay that debt back down the road because, Hey, you've been on this acid blocker for a decade and now you have osteoporosis and you have chronic brain fog and depression. Well, that's what happens when you when you play the symptom game, right? There's always a price you pay. And if you look at any drug for the most part, medications typically decrease uh, bodily function. So you're going to be enzymatic blockers, uptake inhibitors, like proton pump inhibitors, SSRI, ACE inhibitors. They tend to downregulate or block enzymatic pathways. And so they're, they have nothing to do with upregulating physiology, improving performance, improving function. They have to do with downregulating. And so it that's, tends to not really fix the root cause. Maybe good for symptom management, but just kind of understand how conventional medicine works a little bit different from us. And, and there's all the place for, for all of us here. Yeah. Let's uh, reach out to us and get yourself healthy. Get on the road. Yep. HeritageHealth.life for Rob, JustinHealth.com for me. We'll put links down below, guys. Love to see your comments. Let me know your thoughts. We're reading them. Gives us good ideas for future content. Awesome. All right. Have a good one, y'all. Bye. God bless.